Boy, howdy. I cannot believe I get to do this. There are a lot of people here. Could we take an offering? Uh, uh, wow. Wow. Huh. I came to know Jesus when I was 27. Uh, out of an atheist family. My dad's a Mensa atheist, still alive. And a um, bunch of high school kids, my students when I was teaching high school, brought me to Christ. And I, here I am now, getting to speak in front of you who have become my heroes. And uh, so I am so honored. And I'm overwhelmed. Um, I'm frightened. And I'm delighted. And I've just asked... God as I wake up at 4 o'clock Phoenix time. <laughs> that um, he would make this time count. That we wouldn't just bat at the wind. In Genesis, you know the story. After Adam and Eve sinned, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called to the man and said, Where are you? Knowing full well where he was. And he said, Well, I, I, I heard the sound of thee in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. I was afraid because I realized I was naked, and so I didn't know what to do but hide myself. It was the first time that I'd realized I was naked and I was afraid. And on that day, Adam initiates a horrible legacy. He's the first man to ever look over his shoulder. It's the first time we ever see anybody's eyes dart first time we ever see anyone cover themselves, pretending to be somebody else. And now it comes all the way down. And the waters ripple out. And it hits us. And now when you and I get afraid, when we get embarrassed, when we get exposed, when someone has done something to us or we have done something to someone else, something happens. I get naked and so I get afraid and so I want to hide myself. I become convinced that I'm not enough, that I don't match up. And so I learn to hide in one way or another. Adam began it. I've turned it into an art form. As early as we can remember, we have performed for acceptance. If I'm good enough, if I'm talented, diligent, beautiful, together enough, right, correct enough, I will be loved and accepted and blessed and happy, and if not, I will be rejected and receive a lousy life. You know what it is? It's the Santa Claus is coming to town theology. You see, we created Santa Claus because we couldn't handle God. Truth is, we can't handle Santa Claus. <laughs> oh, you better watch out, better not cry, better not pout. I'm telling you why Santa Claus is coming to town. <laughs> He's making a list. Checking it twice, maybe three times. You're going to find out who's naughty or nice. Santa Claus is coming to town. Now, he knows when you've been sleeping, which is wrong in my book. <laughs> right out of the chute. That is not acceptable. I don't care who you are. You don't be watching me wake up in the middle of the night. Ah, Santa, what are you doing in here? Get out of my bedroom. There's no business. I don't care if you're jolly and sassy. Get out. <laughs> he knows when you've been sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you been bad or good for crying out loud, so be good for uh, goodness sake. There it is. The culture created it. 
figure that out. Get it. Grab hold of it. Let that permeate your life. And we sing it over and over because we believe it. There is someone watching. And your value is on how much you do right and how little you do wrong. And, and he's constantly writing down the wrong that you've done for future reference to bring up again to you. And if you're naughty, no soup for you, only coal. And he's going to find you out. Oh, and this omniscient, controlling legalist, he's coming to town. So you better watch out. You better fear this guy. You better stop your crying and sniveling. You better not pout. You better put on a good face. You better act like you're somebody different than who you actually happen to be. No matter how you feel, you better put on a good show. So doggone it, just be better than who you are, for goodness sake. Don't be a whiner. Fix yourself. Try harder. Do more. Be better. Don't have so many problems. Watch over your shoulder. Keep up appearances. Get better in a hurry. And if you can't, act like you are. Because you are constantly on trial. And if you want good things to happen to your life, you better figure out how to keep this guy pleased. It is genetically wired into us since the fall. We learn early on how to perform, how to do the dance. The highest value is being accepted, and it appears the means of that acceptance on this planet is performance. And performance is hard because I fail. It's another result of the fall is the assumption that nobody else fails quite like me. Isn't that right? I assume that you guys have it together and that I'm failing in a particular, unique, singular way. And so I live with the awareness of just how poorly I know I'm doing. And so I must be unfit, I must be unworthy, I must be unlovable, I must be unable. And now I'm naked. And I'm scared. I don't want to be, but I am. And now I know that nobody must know. I've got a posture, I've got to present myself. I've got to mask myself with enough reason to be loved. I must brag. I must put, I've got to put others down. I've got to pretend that I'm more than I am. I've got to idealize myself. I've got to posture and mask. And so I do the dance and I put on the mask. And then comes the gospel. The sweet gospel of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says... He made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Do you see what he did? We get clothed in righteousness. We get covered from our nakedness by the willingness of God to become naked and stay naked and not put on a mask and suffer our penalty. And I find myself believing it. And the pattern gets broken. <laughs> new wiring fills my circuits. I become a new creature. I start believing that I'm lovable just because, well, because he loves me. That I'm accepted and delighted in holy righteousness. I begin to believe that he's created me lovable, that he's exactly who he wanted me to be. He only needed a way to break through sin and death separation, and that radically remakes us. See, don't ever buy that heresy where people say, oh no, you were created loathsome and vile. <laughs> oh, you wicked dog. <laughs> it's like we see God going, oh no, 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 he's gonna pray the prayer. Don't let him pray the prayer. I don't like him, no, no, no. Oh, ain't, oh, no, he prayed the prayer. Oh. <laughs> Shoot, doggone it, all right, you're in. <laughs> uh, I, I, because of Christ, what did I love you now, but I, but I don't like you. <laughs> and when you get to heaven, there will be no padding on the armrest in your chair. I'm telling you that right now. <laughs> Stay out of my way. You bug me. I had to pray your little prayer, didn't you? No, he created me exactly. He wanted there to be a John Lynch on this planet. And he only had to break through death and separation through sin. That's the precious story of Jesus. And I believe it, and I start walking through this life alive, and then ah, something happens. 
I don't know, maybe you go through a season where you don't experience his love as much or you feel dry or you fail God badly. It's something you said you'd never do again. And subtly, gradually, it sneaks back under the door. The lie reawakens. Here's what you do. You begin to think his absence or your bad circumstances are due to his displeasure with you. And you start to try to shore things up and make the grade. You start to set some standards. Oh, that's what i got to do. i got to get serious about being better. I'll I'll get things right. I'll clean house. Then the river will flow again. That's right. I just got a little off kilter. Everything's going to be okay. He's a little upset, but I'll straighten it out. Not long after on this journey, you approach, uh, approach a fork in the road. And there are road signs. It's like you're going along minding your own business. And all of a sudden, you hit a fork in the road, and there's a huge pole, and there's two signs. One says, this path pleasing God. And over here, there's another one, and it says, trusting God. I don't want to choose, I just want to be on this path that I was on. I, 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 I want both. I don't want either of them, but there they are. They're the primary motivations of how I will walk the rest of this journey. The primary motivation of my heart. Will I start out pleasing God? Will I travel that journey or trusting God? And so I look at these two paths and I go, trusting God. What is that? Uh, trusting God. It doesn't do anything. When do I, come on, come on, I want to. All right. Pleasing God. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I want. I want to please God. Yes! That's, that's been the thing all along. I mean, after all he did for me, I, I want to make him happy. I want to let him know that, man, I'm, 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 I'm yeah. That's what I want to do. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm, 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 I'm going down this road. So I go down this road for a while. And soon I come to a huge, huge building. And it's got a door on it. It's got a doorknob, and above the door it says, striving to be all God wants me to be. Yeah, yes, that's right. Striving to be all God wants me to be. I want to be all God wants me to be. It sounds like the Marines. Be all you can be. That's me. Come on. We're going to do it. That's what I've been missing. I just needed this direction. I got I'm here now. I'm going to do it this time. I'm going to do it. Gosh, this time, God, we're going to be close now. And there's a doorknob. And the doorknob says self-effort. And I look at that and I go, well, of course. I mean, I bring, I've got to care now. I've got to do my part. I've got to, I've got to get fired up. And and, and, and God helps those who help themselves. And, 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 And there it is. And I open the door and I walk in. And there's this loud, cacophonous sound. And there's a huge room full of people. And a hostess walks over to me. And she says, in kind of, looking back in retrospect, kind of a slick, smooth, almost too polite voice, Hi, welcome to the room of good intentions. I say, hi. uh, yeah, hi, this is great. I think I found my place. The sold out people I want to be with. This is, how's everybody doing? And all of a sudden it gets quiet, and almost as one voice, the people in the room say, We're doing fine. Fine, we're fine. <laughs> fine as fine can be, just fine, fine. Kind of liquid. We have a couple commodities working through. We're kind of having some divergency resource renewal right there. We're doing fine. Fine, things are. Clicking tight, family's good, we're all doing fine, just just fine as fine can be. That's who we are fine. We're we're, we're fine. And then the host says, and how are you? And I say, "Uh, well, um, thanks for asking. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been struggling a little bit. I'm having some things. I mean, I, I think things are going to be better now that I'm here with you people because you guys are fired up, and, I, and, I, and this is what I want to do, and I'm, I'm excited, and this is... But, but you know, I, I feel like sometimes I want to do things a little bit, you know, that and she goes... And she, 
and she hands me a mask. And I look at the people in the room and they all go, <laughs> and I put the mask on and I say, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, fine, I'm, doing, I'm, do, I'm do, doing, doing, doing just fine, thank you. And then the room goes back into their conversations. I'm in the room of good intentions. And as I walk back to the back of the room, I see a banner. And the banner says that I am working on my sin to achieve an intimate relationship with God. Yeah, yeah, that's right. See, that's what it's always felt like. That's what's been wrong. There, there's been this sin. It, it feels like when I'm talking to God or trying to talk to God, like he's way over there and I'm here and sin's between us. That's what's been wrong. And now because I'm in a group that's fired up and we're going to get things going, I can shrink that. I can make that. I'll work on it. That's what I'll do. I'll fix that stuff. And then God and I will be closer. We're, we're going to be closer. I, I know it's not. I don't know if you can hear me. I know you're way far away. I love you. I love you. I'm going to get this thing better. You wait. You watch. See, I, I'm going to... Because I've, I'm, I'm striving now, I'm trying hard, and I'm going to get it better, and we're going to be close. That's right, I've got to work on my sin. And this time now, this time maybe it'll work. This time I'm going to fix it. And nobody tells me that there's 34 wheelbarrows more of sin that will be brought in daily. And nobody tells me that I don't know how to work on my sin, and I can't. Well, I'll tell you what, though. I'm in this room, and it, it just feels so great at first. I mean, it's got sincerity and perseverance and courage and diligence and full-hearted fervency, a desire to please God, sold-out determination, the pursuit of excellence. Yes, this is the place I've been looking for. I'm going to make him so happy. One day soon we'll be close. But as weeks turn into months, I start to notice some things. Many in this room are starting to sound cynical and they look kind of tired. They're working so hard. Many seem alone. And, and, and if you catch them off guard and they don't think anyone's watching, you see unbelievable deep pain in their faces. The conversations are kind of superficial and guarded. And then I find that I'm starting to think differently. I'm no longer as relaxed here. I have this nagging anxiety that if I don't behave well, if I don't control my sin enough, I'm going to be on the outs with everybody in this room and probably with God. And so I start investing more in effort into sinning less. I sin less. I'm going to do it better. I'm going to shrink that dot. And, and, and I feel better for a uh, while. Wow. But the more time I spend in the room of good intentions, the more disappointed I feel. Despite all my striving and all my efforts, I keep sinning. In fact, some days I get fixated on, on trying to not sin. I can't seem to do enough. I never get through my list. It feels like I'm making every effort to please a God who never seems pleased enough. And I'm so tired. And gradually I start to realize that the... Uh, path of pleasing God turns into what must I do to keep him pleased. And eventually, I can't breathe. I'm so tired. And I stumble out. And I go back to the middle. And I come to the fork in the road again. See, the room of good intentions has this problem. It reduces godliness to this formula. More right behavior plus less wrong behavior equals godliness. Did you hear that? More right behavior, I'm doing great things, less our movies equals godly man. And that's everything but biblical. When we embrace this, it sets me up to live in hiddenness. It disregards the godliness and righteousness that God has already placed in me. 
So you guys, we can never resolve our sin by working on it. We may change the behaviors for a while, move the deck chairs around on the Titanic, but when we strive to sin less, we don't sin less, and the formula creates a permission system for a dozen disguises and it causes us to lose our hope, and it keeps us immature. This theology has been breaking our hearts, and though this toxic thinking has let us down a thousand times, we keep trying to control our bad habits and our sin and make that dot smaller so God and I can one day maybe be closer. And so now I'm back here at the crossroads again. And I come over to this one. Trusting God. Is there another road? (laughs) Man, this one, it seems so less heroic than the other road. A bit ethereal and vague. Doesn't give me anything to do other than Trust. See, I get used to hearing that what, to get what I want, I have to sell out, care more, get on fire, buck up, shape up, do the tighten up. I got to do all those things. But I don't have a choice. It's all that's left. So limping, I walk down this road. Until I finally come to a huge room again, and there's a door, and above the door there is this statement. It says, living out of who God says I am. Whatever. (laughs) There's some words. (laughs) Living out of who God says I am. And then I see a doorknob, and on the doorknob it says humility. And now things start to make sense. Everything closes in. Because I've tried so hard, so stinking hard. I've tried so hard to pull it together to do it, and I can't. God, God, I don't know what to do. If you don't do it, I will not make it. And I walk into this room, another crowded room full of people. And a hostess comes and greets me. And she says, Welcome to the room of grace. And I answer tentatively, because I have already been in a room before, and I say, Thank you. (laughs) And she presses and says, How are you? And I feel like I've been here before. So I say, Fine. I'm pretty fine. Who wants to know? (laughs) And the room stays quiet. Well, now I'm mad because I feel judged. So now I say and I yell out, All right, listen, everybody, I'm not fine. I haven't been fine for a long time. I'm tired and confused and afraid. I feel guilty and lonely. I'm sad most of the time. I can't make my life work. I'm so far behind and befuddled about what to do next, it leaves me frozen most of the time. And if any of you knew half of my daily thoughts, you'd want me out of your little room. So there, I'm doing not fine. (laughs) Thanks for asking. And I reach for the doorknob to walk out of the room, when from the back of the room I hear this voice yelling, That's it? That's all you got? I'll take your confusion and guilt and bad thoughts and I'll raise your compulsive sin and chronic lower back pain. Oh, and I'm in debt up to my ears and I wouldn't know classical music from a show tune if it jumped up and bit me. You better get more than that little list if you want to play in my league, buddy. (laughs) And the hostess nudges me and says, I think he means that you're welcome here. (laughs) And now I'm emboldened, and I answer him back, and I say, "Did, did you struggle forgetting birthdays? And now he's walking towards me, and he comes up to me. And he says, birthdays? Heck, I can't remember my own. 
and there is much warm laughter as I am ushered into a sweet family of kind and painfully real people. And there is not a mass to be seen anywhere. I'm in the room of grace, and there is a banner on the back wall. And I'll think about it in a little bit, but right now I just read it. It says, standing with God, with my sin in front of us, working on it together. You see, you are in the room of grace. Grace. A hundred and twenty-two times in the New Testament. And you can't say grace except in Scottish or Irish because that's how God speaks. <laughs> grace. Oh, and the Judaizers hated it. Oh, they hated it. Paul, Paul, Romans 5 through 8, you dare tell people this. You dare tell them who they are in Christ. You dare tell them that the list is over. You do any of that, they're, 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 they're going to space out. You know these people, they're vermin. I tell you what, they're going to do Christianity light. They're going to take advantage of God. They're going to space out. They're not going to care as much. They're not going to live for Jesus. And, and Paul says, you know, that, 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 that you got a point there. That would be exactly right, except for two things. They have a new identity. On my worst day, you guys, I'm Christ in John Lynch. Christ in John Lynch, with a robe of righteousness on me, always. And not only that, but I have the Holy Spirit constantly. Paul says to the Judaizers, they don't want to take advantage of God. And by the way, if they wanted to take advantage of God, they could do it under grace or law. But what if the goal was to free their hearts so that they could come and be intimate and close to this one that they have fallen in love with? That would take grace. That's the New Testament gamble, a piece I wrote a while back. This is what God did. This is what he laid on the table. And you and I are the guinea pig test. Would it work? Would our children grow up spaced out about God? If I gave them grace, and I'm right in the middle of it, I've got a son who's 18, a daughter who's 16, and a daughter who's 10, I'm right in the middle of this. Does this work? The New Testament gamble is God saying, what if I tell them who they are? What if I take away any element of fear and condemnation or judgment or rejection? What if I tell them that I love them and I'll always love them and that I can't love them anymore and I love them right now and that I love them right now no matter what they've done as much as I love my only son? that there's nothing they can do to make my love go away? What if I told them there are no lists? What if I told them that they were righteous with my righteousness right now? What if I told them they could stop beating themselves up, that they could stop being so formal and stiff and jumpy around me? What if I told them that I was absolutely crazy about them? What if I told them that even if they ran to the ends of the earth and did the most unthinkable, horrible things and killed me and were unfaithful in their marriage, when they came back, I'd receive them with tears and a party? What if I told them that I don't keep a log of past offenses of how little they pray, how often they've let me down or made promises they don't keep? What if I told them they don't have to be owned by men's religious traditions or additions? What if I told them that I'm their savior, they're going to heaven no matter what, it's a done deal? What if I told them that they had a new nature, that they were saints, not saved sinners who should now bucket and be better if you're any kind of a Christian after all he's done for you? What if I told them I actually live in them now? that I've put my love and power and nature inside them at their disposal? What if I told them that they didn't have to put on a mask? That it was really okay to be exactly who they are at this moment with all their junk and not have to pretend about how close we are, how much they pray or don't, how much Bible they read or don't? What if they didn't have to look over their shoulder for fear if things got too good, the other shoe was going to drop? What if they knew I will never, ever, 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 ever use the word punish in relation to them? What if they knew that when they mess up, I never get back at them? What if they were convinced that bad circumstances are not my way of evening the score for taking advantage of me? What if they knew the basis of our friendship was not how little they sinned, but on how much they let me love them? What if they had permission to stop trying to impress me in any way? What if I told them they could hurt my heart, but I tried to never hurt theirs? What if I told them that I kind of like Eric Clapton's music too? 
that the these and thous have sort of always bugged me. What if I told them I never really liked the Christmas handbell deal with the white gloves? <laughs> that they could open their eyes when they pray and still they might go to heaven. What if I told them that there was no secret agenda, no trap door? What if I told them it wasn't about their self over but about allowing me to live my life through them? That's the New Testament gamble. And it's being lived out in you and I right now. We are the guinea pig test. You see, there's this verse in Hebrews. Hebrews 11.6, Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Do you see the two paths there? Do you notice that trusting is what pleases God? Do you notice that there's no pleasing of God without trusting him? So I can walk over here and say, I'm going to please you, God, and I can never please him enough, and I also never learn how to trust. Because it's all about me. And over here, as I find that I'm trusting him, he says, John, you've never pleased me so much in your whole life. See, pleasing God is an incredibly good longing. It just can't be the primary motivation, or it will imprison our hearts. For all, if, if all we bring to God is our moral striving to please him by solving our sin, we're back at the same insufficient square one that puts us in need of a savior. We're stuck with our talent, skill, desire, ability, longing, chutzpah, diligence, and resolve to make it happen. And I don't have it. And so I think back again of the banner on the back wall in the Room of Grace standing with my God, with my sin in front of us, working on it together. See, all this time I thought that he was over there. I used to write a journal, and I stopped doing it because I couldn't take it anymore, all the self-deprecation and beating myself up. But what if, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, what if he was never over there? What if Jesus Christ walked all the way around and walked up to me and grabbed my shoulders and looked into my face and put his hands on my face and stroked my hair and says, I know, I know, I love you so much. I'm crazy about you. And I know all the stuff. And I'm not ashamed. I've known from before the world began and nothing you can do can make me love you more, and nothing will ever make me love you less. I'm crazy about you. And what if he puts his arm around me, and we look at my sin together? He would say, that is a lot of sin. <laughs> <laughs> My, my, my. <laughs> and we'll work on it when you're ready, kid. I got you covered. I've known all about it from before the world began. My shed blood is that powerful. I'm crazy about you. Have we been changed? Yeah. As day is from night, we've been changed. We've been changed... We've been given a brand new core identity. We've already been changed, and now we get to mature into who we really are. You see, if I brought a caterpillar to a biologist and asked him to analyze and describe its DNA, he'd say, John, I know it looks like a caterpillar to you, but scientifically, in every testable DNA result, this is fully and completely a butterfly. Wow! God is wired into a creature looking nothing like a butterfly, a completely complete, perfect butterfly identity. And because the caterpillar is a butterfly in essence, it will one day display the behaviors and attitudes and attributes of a butterfly. The caterpillar matures into what is already true about it. In the meantime, berating the caterpillar for not being more like a butterfly will probably just hurt its little ears. <laughs> and so it is with us. God has given us the DNA of godliness. We're saints, we're righteous, and nothing we do will make us more godly than we already are. God knows our DNA. He knows we're Christ in me, and now he's asking us to join him in what he already knows is true. And so here you sit today, my sweet brothers and sisters, and some of you are bluffing. Some of you are playing around your backhand. Some of you are trying to put on a game face and you're wearing a mask that is so tightly affixed and you're scared. You're scared that someone will know inside. And Jesus says, I got you, kid. May I dare believe 
that God means I'm a new creature right now. May I dare believe that God's crazy about me right now. May I dare believe that I'm not on God's B team. May I dare believe that I don't have to do penance after I fail. May I dare believe that I don't have to put on appearances because God knows the exact pace of my maturity. May I dare believe that I'm considered righteous right now even though I still act out in wrong ways. May I dare believe that I'm godly because I share this nature fused with the king of the universe. May I dare believe that God doesn't keep a logbook of my offenses bringing them up to me from time to time. May I dare believe that God's never disgusted with me or ashamed of me. May I? Because it would free everything. You see, in the room of good intentions, we strive to change into something we aren't yet, godly. In the room of grace, we grow up and mature into something that's already true about us, godly. The first room creates a work-based, performance-driven relationship with God and puts the emphasis on the efficacy of my effort. The second room places the responsibility on the resources of God. God isn't interested in changing you. He already has. The DNA is set. God wants us to believe that he's already changed us so he can get on with maturing us and who already, who he's already made us. And trust opens the way for God to bring us to maturity. Without trust, we don't mature because we're trying to change to become God. It's what Peterson talks about in the message from, from Galatians 3.5. He says, does the God who lavishly provides you with his own presence, his, own, his Holy Spirit, work things in your lives that you could never do for yourself? Does he do these things because of your strenuous moral striving or because you trust him to do them in you? And I know some of you are saying, gosh, where was this years ago before I put on all these masks? See, the trouble with masks, you put them on so that you'll be loved. But the problem with mass is it keeps you from being loved. Your mask receives love, you get nothing. You can't even give out love. And so here I am, and I'm saying, where was this message sooner? And so there is a gift giver. His name is Jesus. And for every malady, for every mass, he gives a gift. For this particular stuff, there is repentance formed of trust, not willpower. There is forgiveness formed of trust, not begrudging compliance. And there is love received, not just given. Now, people go in and out of the room of grace. I wish it wasn't true, but not all stay once they come in for not only not only must you believe that you are accepted, you must actually learn to accept the yokels who are already here <laughs> and who come in fresh each week. And they are goofy and flawed and failed and common and odd and broken and weird and often very inappropriate. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, every now and then a presentable one slips in. But he usually soon learns his presentableness was actually a mask. He, too, must learn to rest in the sufficiency of Christ, or he'll go soon back to where appearances make the man. And when you think you don't belong, or that you're too failed, or too unfit, or that you can't live amongst this band of rabble without a mask, they will each in their own way, this sweet group, this sweet, precious room of grace that is developing and growing into a room of grace, and I watch you. And may I tell you, the Navigators is becoming a room of grace. It's precious for me to watch. And when you think you are not enough, look around this band of rabble, and they will say to you, when you are done with your litany, they will say, that's it? That's all you got? It's their way of saying you're welcome here. But that's not it. If that were it, that would be great. But the goal of the room of grace is not just my healing. It's my release. It's moving me into my dreams and my destiny. Ever since we were children, we had dreams and hopes of destiny. Some of these dreams are our own, but others came from the very hand of God, and God's dreams never go off the radar screen. Even time and failure or heartbreak can't make us forget them entirely. Still, most of us have tried to stuff them into the attic. We've been rudely awakened out of too many of them too many times, and each time we lost more and more of the dream. Yet even if we've forgotten the fire of those dreams, God is not. God's dreams are that you would discover your destiny and walk into the reasons he placed you on this earth. 
God has a ticket of destiny with your name actually written on it. No matter how old you are, how broken you are, how tired or frightened you are, no matter how many times you failed. And so after time in the room of grace, receiving the gifts of grace, the day comes. For some, the release feels premature. For others, the wait is agonizingly long, but all have learned to believe that it would arrive. Life in the room of grace teaches us to wait for God's exaltation rather than to pursue power or position. It's always the perfect time. For one thing, our dreams are being clarified as our sin is being resolved and our wounds are being healed and we're in the process of maturing. Our lives are no longer about proving our worth to others through what we get to do. And then one day, the whys stop. Why has it taken so long? Why did so many revisions of the dream have to die or be rerouted all those years? For on that day, a mature friend, or maybe some, some mature friends, they escort you to the far back of the room and they tell you only this. We all knew this day was coming. I'm so proud of you. And they drop you off at what looks like a train station. And a fog of steam reveals the only, only the outline of someone standing just outside an arch with the words dream and destiny written across it. You approach the arch and you discover the figure is a ticket taker or ticket giver. And he's got one ticket in his hand. He smiles kindly and broadly and he puts his hands on, his sh on your shoulders and he looks into your eyes for quite a long time before speaking. And when he does, you realize suddenly it's the ticket giver. He's the same one who handed you those grace gifts all along. And as he hands you the ticket, he tells you that this day was prepared before the world began. He tells you that this moment couldn't have been forced or rushed or manipulated to come one moment sooner. He tells you that he loves you as much as his father loves him. And then he hugs you for a long time. And then he hands you the ticket. And he tells you that this destiny that was written across, it was created specially for you, and then ushers you away with the words, now hurry up, get on that train. A whole lot of folk are waiting for you to walk into the destiny and into their lives. And you fall to your knees and, and you cry, stunned at such grace and such love. And then you get up and you look back one more time and you smile at the gift giver and at the ticket giver. And you run to the train and out into the lives of those who need a room of grace. This is not a game. This is not religious consolation. This is a realm. And it's real. And people live there. And some of them are you. Thanks so much for letting me preach this.